need to make a new intro with you in it. <laughs> the stone that the builders rejected has been made the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is wondrous to our eyes. This is a day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And with that, with that, I welcome you to your father's house this morning on this first day. Brothers and sisters, I'm standing before you this morning as a witness. A witness to the fact that Jesus Christ is alive. I gave my life not to a dead Christ, but to a live Christ. I serve a living Savior. He gives me a song to sing. He gives me something to believe in. I have a reason for existence. I know where I come from, I know why I'm here, and I know where I'm going to you. Let us pray. Heavenly and almighty God, we come before you humbled and sorrowful, aware of our sin, and ready to repent. Lord, forgive us, for we have sinned before you. Wash away our sin, purify us, and help us to turn from this sin. Lead us to walk in your way instead, leaving behind our life and starting a new life with you. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Good morning. We're going to start here with him, only trust him. All right, Joan, you ready? All right. What? Come, every soul by sin oppressed, there's mercy with the Lord, and He will surely give you rest by trusting in the Word. Only trust Him, only trust Him, only trust Him now. He will save you. Trust him, only trust him now. 
All right, we're going to do this next one is, is it really in the hymnal? I thought I looked this up. There's a number on there, but I don't think that's the number for this hymn. I might be wrong. Well, well I'm, it, oh, it oh, I be. see, yeah. yeah. Unless, I was, I was going to say, I, I, I pulled this from a different hymnal, which some of you will be excited for and some of you won't. It's from, mm -hmm. a, it's from our old Baptist hymnal. From oh, yeah, the, there we go. Uh, well, let me put my capo on so I'm playing in the same key as everybody else. That would help. Uh, let me let me sh show you the melody before we begin, since I'm assuming many of you have no idea what the song goes. So it's. Lord Jesus, I long to be perfectly whole. I want Thee forever to live in my soul. Break down every idol, out e cast out every foe. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. And the chorus is, Whiter than snow, yes, whiter than snow. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. All right, there's how it goes. One, two, three, one. Lord Jesus, I long to be perfectly whole. I want Thee forever to live in my soul. Break down every idol, cast out every foe. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Whiter than snow, yes, whiter than snow. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Lord Jesus, look down from your throne in the sky and help me to make a complete sacrifice. I give up myself. And ever I know, now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Whiter than snow, yes, whiter than snow. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Lord Jesus, for this I most humbly entreat. I wait, blessed Lord, at thy crucified feet. By faith for my cleansing, I see your blood flow. Now wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Whiter than snow, yes, whiter than snow. Now wash me, and I shall be than snow. Lord Jesus, before you, you I patiently wait. Come now and within me a new heart create. To those who have sought you, you never said no. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Whiter than snow, yes, whiter than snow. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Good morning. I'm glad you made it in all safe and sound. It's pretty uh, icy out there. You can have like skates on on our parking lot over there. So I'm glad you're safe and I pray that you have a 
safe trip back to your car and a safe trip home today. How are you doing on this New Year's, still New Year, right? 9th of January, right? Wow, it's already 9th of January. Can you believe it? It'll like be summer in no time. I mean, we're, we're just really, really moving along. Are there any good things you'd like to share with us today? What are some joys in your life? Oh, we need to. Joan, where you got the microphone? Joan's right here. It should be on, don't it? should be it's on. It's on. Okay. All right, Joan's going to be our Vanna White today. So, but in turn, yeah, she's going to turn other things. Don't other I than look them. like her? You look like her, exactly. Are uh, there some joys in your life you want to share with us today? Tell us what's good. Had my final checkup with my eye doctor, and uh, everything went well with my cataract surgery, and I good. only have to wear cheaters. I don't have to wear glasses. Yay! <laughs> That's awesome. Next. Something good about science, isn't there? <laughs> Other good things. I was thinking this morning when I got here, you know what life is like. It's kind of going on a slippery slope. You know, uh, walking across the parking lot and all the ice and everything. I thought maybe it was kind of a lot like life is. Because <laughs> when we walk, we, we don't know for sure what direction we're going to go. But then when I reached the sidewalk... The good thing was it was clear, and I had good footing, footing all the way into the church. And I knew that must be what God is really like. Yes, God is really like that, is that we go on a slippery slope all of our life, and then we find God, and it's a straight path right to the throne. That is good news, right? Thank you, Dick, Linda for that. Linda Stancil would tell you it's not any fun to fall. I just want to thank everyone for their prayers for my two brothers uh, last week. My one brother went home from the hospital on Monday, yes. and he and his family are doing much, much better. That's so great. thank you all for prayers. Prayers work. Absolutely. Amen. We'll keep them both in our prayers. Anyone else? Speaking of the parking lot... <laughs> and the slippery slope, I have a story to tell. You know, we had the big snowfall on Tuesday. So Jan and I, we came over here, and uh, I cranked out the beast. That's the snow blower. if anybody don't know what the beast is. It's harder to uh, operate than a riding a Harley is, believe me. But anyway, while we were, Jan and I were clearing the walkways and all that and having a lot of fun out here, um, this guy pulls up with a pickup truck, and he has a snow blade on the front. And he says, hey, you want me to go ahead and uh, plow your parking lot? And uh, I said, how much? He said, no charge. I have some kids, and they would have great fun doing this. <laughs> so wouldn't you know it, uh, Janet, I was off busy, and this guy starred in, and I guess the three kids he had were riding on top of the blade. He was snow plowing oh, the parking lot. <laughs> oh, boy. And not only that, this good Samaritan, he not only did the parking lot, which turned into an ice skating rink, but he also did the north side parking lot. And, uh, you know, I'm just uh, really grateful because I didn't have any, I didn't plan for this or anything. He just... Uh, him and his kids were having a blast, and I just, whoever that good Samaritan is, I thank him, and anyway, that's that. I woke up early to a good Samaritan plowing out my sidewalk. He has, or not my sidewalk, but driveway. He has accounts nearby. He was on a time schedule, and he gave me a quick, Merry Christmas, <laughs> Well, at our house, John is usually the Good Samaritan that goes up and down the sidewalk, but uh, lately, the gentleman at the end of the street has been beating him to it. But the other day, he had the worst one. When the worst snow came, then John had to go and do it. <laughs> but anyway, and our neighbors brought him over a bag of snickerdoodle cookies for thank you for doing that. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, Praise that Tom is doing well. The surgery went well, he said, and his arm is going to be in the 
cast for quite a while yet, so just pray that he doesn't fall again and break the other one so he won't be able to drink coffee. That would be terrible. <laughs> we also have a new family with us today, and I didn't get their names, but they've got three lovely children that are back there. And their daughter said this is the first time she's ever been in a church. So make sure that they feel welcome, and we're glad to have you, and we hope you come back many, many, many more times and become a part of our family. Yes. Yeah. Glad you found us. The other thing I'd like to say, um, we've been watching old movies lately because there's nothing else to do, really. So we watched uh, Lord of the Rings. And at the end of the last one, when they come out of the, I don't know if any of you have seen that, but they come out of the volcano, I guess you'd call it, and they feel like their lives are over. And then the next scene is when Frodo is recovering um, and everything around him is all white. And standing at the foot of the bed is uh, the wizard, um, Gandalf, and he's Gandalf the White now. So he's all dressed in white and, and looking at Frodo. And they kind of look at each other, and then they break into a little smile, and then they just belly laugh. You know, just the relief of everything being over and done and wonderful and life goes on. That's what I want to do when I see Jesus. I just want to look at him and belly laugh. <laughs> no, we're not done. We're just starting. I would like to uplift RJ. He has a case of bronchitis and he was very ill. And he is recuperating, and we pray that God will continue to um, have this improvement in him. And we're thankful that we can go to God and, and ask for healing. And also Linda Stansall, she, I'm sure, would appreciate prayers for her continued healing. And I want to thank Pastor Renee for being so diligently uh, carrying on our church during hard times and uh, during the COVID. And now we're springing back, aren't we? And we l are so thankful for a new year and a new beginning. Amen. Are there other prayers you have to like to offer today? Nope. Thank you, Vanna. Let us pray together, my friends. Gracious and holy God, you are our God. You are our God during COVID or during happy times, healthy times and sick times. You're with us when our loved ones pass, when we're in the hospital ourselves. You're with this church. doesn't matter if it's full or empty, you're here. And we appreciate your love and your grace and the promises that you have made for us throughout the years and throughout the Bible. We've lifted up some prayers this morning, and I know there are probably many more in our hearts. And let us just take a moment of silence to lift them up to you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Who taught us to pray a while back when he said these words. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May have those who are bringing the offering plates get the offering plates. Hint, hint.
for the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Where did we lose Joan to? Joan to. You may be seated. I think she's applying for the Price is Right or something like that. <laughs> well, too bad. I guess we're moving on without her. Let's see if I can get that where it's supposed to be. All right. <laughs> this next one is not the song that we intended it to be. But that's okay, it still works. The one God attended. Yes, me. yes. This is the one that was supposed to be here. Hey, Don't is that better? Off. Can you hear me now? Okay, God does speak to us in a way that we can understand. Also, in Holy Scripture, when we are given instances of our patriarchs who maybe don't live quite up to the mark, God tells us about it, warts and all. And we have that occasion this morning in the Scripture reading this morning. King David charged by God to lead the Israelites as their king. Now, you would think that we would put King David probably up on a pillar and look up to him. But King David was a man. 
just as you and I are. And one day he was out on his terrace and he happened to look over there and here was this beautiful young thing taking a bath. Now why she was taking a bath outside, I have no idea, but she was. Her name was Bathsheba. And you know what the rest of the story is there. After this took place, Nathan, the prophet, came to David and convicted him, if you will, of his sin. Just as the Holy Spirit convicts us daily of our sin. And David chose to repent. And I'm going to read now Psalm 51, which is David's prayer of repentance. Listen to the word of God. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner, when my mother conceived me. You desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain in me a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from bloodshed, O God, O God of my salvation and my tongue will sing aloud of your deliverance. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you have no delight in sacrifice. If I were to give a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, then you will delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings, and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. This is the word of God. Praise be to God. Thank you, Gary. Repent. <laughs> what? Should I say it louder? Repent! People of God, repent! It's not the kind of sermons I usually give. <laughs> you know, God made me how God made me. And I know that for some of you, you'd rather, rather have me a little bit more conservative and a little more repenting sermons and all those kind of, you know, the kind of co kind of sermons that I heard when I started, when I wanted to go to church, but scared the hell out of me. And so, having that history and having that 
kind of a negative kind of idea about some of those churchy words that are kind of scary made me kind of go the other way. It made me kind of look at love and grace, and, and that's kind of where I got stuck, I think. I know there's another side, and there's nothing wrong with that side, but just God made me to preach to love people into his grace. And, and there's another side that kind of scares people into God's grace. And, you know, there's dif- different people, and people need different kind of things, and I think that's okay. Um, but for me, um, preaching repenting has to do a lot with living life, and that we need to repent to live life. So let's see what I can do with this word. You guys ready? So it's the breaking of the chain of sin. That's what we're talking about today. And it is time to... Oh, say it like you mean it. It's time to... All right, there we go. Now, we started last week with repentance, right? John the Baptist came to the river of Jordan, and he was setting the way up for Jesus. And that's what he talked about, right? He said, come and be baptized for the repentance of your sin, right? Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand now. Not just when we pass, not just when it's all over, but now during this lifetime, right now, the kingdom of God is at hand. And that is good news, is it not? We don't have to wait to see Jesus. We don't have to wait to become Christians. We don't have to wait to um, work on, look at the promises that God has made throughout the Bible and for us as well. So that's what John talked about last week. Jesus said, um, remember the story of the Tower of Siloam? And it fell and it killed some. And back during those days, it was like when something bad happened to you, when you were sick or you were blind, any of those kind of things, that meant that you're a sinner, you did something bad, and God was paying you back for it. It was that kind of a God that, you know, puts a thumb down on you when you didn't do the right thing. And Jesus always talked about against that, didn't he? Remember when the blind man was there and all his disciples said, oh, Jesus, who sinned, him or his parents or his grandparents? Who, why does God make him blind? And Jesus said, nobody made him blind. He's blind. Nobody sinned to have him blind. And it's the same with this story right there. He goes on to say, you know what? Some people repent, some people don't. There's good and there's bad, but these people died because the tower fell. Not for a reason. Not because they were worse than others. Just because they were there at the wrong place in the wrong time. But he goes on to say, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Right? What is repenting about? It's about life and it's about being saved. Those are the two things that really connect us to being, to, to repent. Paul talked about that as well, and he writes, he writes about repentance. He says, Godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. The sorrow of the world produces death. And here we have this chance of, of um, being baptized and dying with Christ and, and being raised again in his image and with his heart. And repentance is part of that. And that's what we're talking about today, creating a, a path for us to, be, um, to remember or to reaffirm our baptism in a couple of weeks. So what is repentance? Repentance, it's, it's pretty simple. It's a, a change of mind that leads to a change of heart. It begins here and we decide, but it ends up in our heart and it changes who we are. And this change involves both turning from sin and turning to God turning away from the sins that we create, that we make, that we live in, and to turn our face to God. Repentance is a major biblical topic, isn't it? All the prophets mention it in one way or another. Isaiah called Israel to repent. Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Hosea and Micah and Malachi, they all talk about repenting to Israel because apparently Israel has lost its way. They did not face God, listen to God anymore, but they decided they wanted to be their own God and make their own choices and their own decisions. And at some point that created trouble for them. And so all of the, the um, prophets asked them to go back and turn around to repent of their sins and then turn back to God. The entire message of Jesus is uh, summed up in these words, right? Repent and believe the good news. 
turn to God and believe the good news. And people should repent. In Mark 6, 12, O Lord also declared, I am not to come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. And repentance and forgiveness of sins be preached in his name to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. When Peter he heard these words, he also, remember at Pentecost, at the end of his long sermon, he said, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. So there's a lot of talk about repentance in the Bible. What does it mean to repent? There's a couple good scriptures that kind of talk to us about that. In Acts 11, 18, he said, when they heard this, they quieted down and they glorified God, saying, well then, God has granted to the Gentiles also the repentance that leads to life. These were Jews talking and thought that they were the chosen one and only they would create this, we could get this life from God, but they were, they were wrong. 2 Corinthians 7.10 says, For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation. Leading to salvation. So it's life and salvation that are the gifts from God, from us repenting to God and from us turning back to God. Death to sin and life to obedience. We're going to talk about obedience on the day that we have our baptism. But once we repent, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a second, and obedience is kind of the next part. We have kind of have to be obedient to the will of God and to what it is that God wants us to do. It's easy to move on, repent, and then turn around and live our life like we had before. But the point is to change, right? To change. You know, during, um, let's see, before we get to, to Easter tide or for Easter time, we, we have this time where we're supposed to give up something, right? And we give up chocolate and, and whatever else that's bad for us. And then once Easter's over, we go right back to chocolate. I mean, that's, that's, kinda, that's our mindset in this, right? We repent, oh good, and I'm saved, and now I'm going to go back to exactly the way I lived my life before. And that's really not what repenting is. You know, we're supposed to give something up, and then we're supposed to try not to go back to it because we gave it up in the first place because it wasn't good for us, right? But our mindset is just a little different than that. We don't become obedient afterwards. We go back to our regular life. You want to know what repentance is really like? It's like this. Anybody ever jumped out of an airplane in a parachute? No? I have a picture I thought I had up there. Did I have it later? I have, might have it later. All right, let's go there. What is repentance? There's several steps to it. One, you have to recognize what you did wrong, which might be the toughest one, right? I mean, to live your life the way out and to and to sin, and to do things you know probably God wouldn't want you to do, you have to recognize that that's what you're doing. You are doing something wrong. If you can't do this step, then you're out of luck already until you get to that point. So how do we, how do we get to that point? Well, somebody's got to convict us, like David was convicted, right? Some preacher might preach a, stor a story or a sermon that we walk away from and go, oh, this is probably wrong. I probably shouldn't live my life like this. But I am anyway, but so maybe it's wrong. And then you struggle with that wrong for a while. You may not change it that day, but you may want to not do it anymore and then do it again, and then you go, darn, and you try it again, and you try it again, and you try it again. But unless you recognize you did something wrong, then there's no repentance in sight. You have to feel sorry. And this is not the kind of sorry that says, oh, I'm sorry I got busted, <laughs> right? Or I'm sorry that it created this problem in my life because that's what we're usually sorry about. We need to be sorry about what we did. You know, that sin that we committed, and whatever it might be, we have to be sorry that we committed that sin, knowing that God wouldn't want us to. Then we have to confess and ask for forgiveness. Not only to God, but to the person that was affected. Right? If you mess with somebody, you lie to somebody, you steal from somebody, you do something somebody that is a sin, you should go back to them and you should ask them for forgiveness. And then ask God for forgiveness as well. Part of repenting is restitution. That's the other thing that we don't really usually do. We go back and we say, I'm sorry, I stole that $100 from you, and I won't do it again, and I'm sorry. <laughs> All right? But really, you should pay that person back that $100. I mean, that's really part of forgiveness and repentance, right? It's that little step that says, here's the $100 bucks back. You know, you're supposed to restore the relationship. You restore what you did wrong. 
We forget that sometimes. And then we will have to do better. And we think of ways to do better next time, right? If we know what we did wrong, we can probably plan ahead a little bit and make sure we don't do that wrong again. Right? If I keep eating chocolate, I should stay out of the chocolate store or something because the minute I walk in there, I'm going to have some chocolate. I mean, it right? makes sense. Right? If you don't want to smoke cigarettes, then don't hang around where people are smoking. You go outside with them while they're smoking, you're going to want to smoke a cigarette. I mean, you have to plan ahead a little bit, and you have to make sense out of your life and say, okay, if I do this, this happens, and I don't want that to happen, and so I've got to think about that and make better decisions and better choices. And then you give thanks in prayer for the atonement of Jesus, right? That's what we do. We repent, and we are saved in that moment because of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. to light and repent up a little bit. Thanks, old pal. George! Never jump into a pile of leaves with a wet sucker. Say, Charlie Brown, I've got a football. How about practicing a few place kicks? I'll hold the ball, and you come running and kick it. Oh, brother. I don't mind your dishonesty half as much as I mind your opinion of me. You must think I'm stupid. Oh, come on, Charlie Brown. No. I'll hold it steady. No. Please. You just want me to come running up to kick that ball so you can pull it away and see me land flat on my back and kill myself. This time you can trust me. See, here's a signed document testifying that I promise not to pull it away. It is signed. It's a signed document. I guess if you have a signed document in your possession, you can't go wrong. This year I'm really going to kick that football. Peculiar thing about this document, it was never notarized. So was, re was she repentant? <laughs> I know you've seen these before probably every year, like Thanksgiving time, right? There's different, three or four different times that she does that to him. And, and then she does it again and again and again. That's not being repentant, right? No doubt about it. That's like saying something and lying about it and doing it again and again and again. And even though she asks for forgiveness and she tells him, she's telling the truth, she has a signed document and, and all kinds of things, she doesn't ever tell the truth. She's never really repentant because she never really feels sorry for what she did. In fact, she wants to do it again and again and again, right? So, here's what repentance really looks like. We're in an airplane, 7,000 feet up in the sky. Everything looks kind of small when you're looking out. This guy has been wanting to jump out of an airplane with a parachute for a long, long time. He went to the training and did everything. And now he was up there solo for the first time. And he looks out the door and he watches the guys in front of him just go. And it's his turn. And he says, no, I cannot go. I don't want to go. I'm, I'm afraid. I can't jump. I can't jump. I can't jump. And then he turns around. He gets back into the plane and takes his seat. That is what repentance is all about. You recognize the situation. You know you're fearful and you don't want to do it. And you turn around and you don't do it again. That is repentance, right? If you look at the word repentance in the Bible, in the New Testament there's really only one word we need to worry about. And that word is um, meta, metonia. Metanio. I can't say it right. Metonia? Metonia. And it literally means, it's, it's used quite a bit in the New Testament. 
And it means to change a mind, to change your mind. So repentance ultimately, fundamentally, means that we change our mind and then have a change of heart because of that. And because we have a change of heart, it's not just a decision anymore, but it's, it's more than that. Both pieces of your body that makes choices and decisions are involved suddenly, and we repent from the things that we should not do, that we know that we've can, been convicted about. We all do it. You know, we all sin, and we all need to repent again and again and again. So I know there's stuff in your life you want to get rid of. And why don't we pray about that right now? Gracious and holy God, we know that the world has a lot of power over us and that we feel obligated or ashamed into or pressured into by our friends and our neighbors. There are things we do that don't make you happy, that, that get us away from your presence, from your love, from your grace, that turn us not towards you, but turn us towards the world. And, and any time we listen to the world instead of you, it creates problems for us. And we can't really do it on our own and by ourselves. We really need your strength and your power and your promises in our life so that we can repent, that we have the strength and the, and the awareness of recognizing what we're doing wrong and that through your help we can fix that. We can come to you on our knees and pray for forgiveness and repentance and that we can walk away from that moment and we can have our change of heart and we go back into this world stronger and better understanding of who you are and who we are and how much we need your love and grace in our life. Repentance, God, is not only helpful for salvation and to be in your kingdom finally, but it's also helpful for ourselves in this world right now because your kingdom is at hand. And the people we love and the people that are in our lives they deserve better from us. They deserve our grace and our love and our patience and not our sin. There are probably sins in our lives and let us just take a moment of silence to have our own little conversation with God about what those things are that we might want to give up this day. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There, is a, there is a story in the Bible about repentance that I love very much, and it's the, the story of the prodigal son, and some of you might be familiar. This prodigal son had a brother and a family and, and worked on his dad's farm and ranch, but he got tired of working one day, and he said to his dad, you know, Dad, I'm really kind of tired of shoveling poop and doing all this stuff here. I think I want my inheritance today. I don't want to wait until you die. I want it now, and I want to go spend it how I want to spend it. So in, in those days, when the son did that, it pretty much said to me, Dad, you're dead to me. I mean, that's really what it said. It wasn't just about the money, but it was about the relationship that they had with each other. And so the son goes out into town and, and has lots of friends suddenly. And they party and they party and the friends are around and he's buying another round and another round and, and he's doing great. He's loving his life and love the decision that he's made. And guess what happens one day? He runs out of money. And suddenly he runs out of friends. And that's a problem because now he's not having as much fun anymore as he did before. Not only is he not having any more fun, he's also getting thrown out of his little apartment that he was in. Because he can't pay the rent anymore. And he's got no food. And somebody that has a, a swinery, <laughs> get it? Swinery. He's got a place where he raises pigs. And so he starts trying to get a job there, and, he, and the guy feels sad for him, and he hires him. And he works in a pig pen, working with the pigs. 
but still starving. And he gets to the point after a few more weeks of this that he thinks about eating the pig food. And that must have been rock bottom for him. I don't know what your rock bottom is to get away from your sins, but this was his. And so he says, you know what? Even the slaves in my father's house have better food and better accommodations. I'm just going to go back and tell them how sorry I am, and how bad I feel, and that I'd be glad to go back and just work for him like other slaves are. All right, and our repentance idea, right? He recognizes he did something wrong. He realizes that this is not the life that he needs to live, and he can't, or he's going to die. And so he decides to go back and to grovel. And he's still not even close to the house, and his dad sees him from far away, and he comes running to him, open arms, and he hugs him. And he says to his servants, go get the best shoes, get his robe, get his ring, get all his stuff back, and put it back on, because the son of mine was dead, but he's alive. And his son is just, he doesn't even want this stuff. He's just so sorry, and he just asks him for forgiveness. So he wants to repent, and he is repenting. He's going back to the source. He's trying to make right by working for his dad rather than having his inheritance. And his dad, like God, takes him in. You know, sadly enough, there's a spy story about his brother who's just not happy with the situation. And isn't that us sometimes? You know, sometimes we see people that we don't think deserve to have repentance. We say, what? I've been in church for 400 years. They've just started coming last week. How can they go back to God and be saved? Well, that's just the way it works, right? It's grace. It's love. It's unmerited. It's not earned. It's a gift from God. And those are the promises that God made to us throughout the Bible, to for the Israelites as well as for us. That's your cue. That's my cue. Promises, right? <laughs> and we maybe have to stand for this song. What do you think, David? You it like is, in, make, the, it you is like, in the title. <laughs> you like to make people stand, right? No, not really. I just felt like it yesterday. <laughs> but it is in the title, so why don't we stand? <sighs> so I had enough of the repentance songs after all the other ones. I was like, let's do a song about why we're even bothering. It's a good move. All right. One, two, three. Standing on the promises of God, my King. Through eternal ages let his praises ring Glory in the highest to the kingdom sing Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises of I not fail, when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to Him eternal by the love strong cord, overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword. Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing, standing 
I'm standing on the promises of God Standing on the promises I cannot fall Sensing every moment to the Spirit's call Resting to the Savior as an all in all Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God and my Savior Standing, standing I'm standing on the promises of God Brothers and sisters, this week, listen to Jesus Christ. Never cease to walk with Jesus and live only for him. Know that you belong to Jesus and that God your Father loves you. And above all, do as Jesus Christ taught us. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Shalom. Go in peace.